Hi, I'm Janet Deneef, founder and director of the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival. You are about to hear one of our highlight conversations recorded live for our 2022 festival, which explored the role of the written word in upholding humanity's values and freedoms through our festival theme, Mamayu Hayuning Bawana, Uniting Humanity. So please settle in and let the magic of our 19th festival continue. Thank you very much for coming along today. Um, this is a really actually an exciting time to be speaking about Indonesian art and the future of Indonesian art because an Indonesian collective called Ruan Grupa was actually the directors of Documenta. So for those who aren't familiar with Documenta, it's held every five years in Germany and is probably considered, I think, you know, the most important contemporary art exhibition in the world. And this year was really interesting in that it was the first time that Documenta was directed by a group rather than, in, you know, an individual. And it was also directed by Ruin Gruppe, which have a really fascinating philosophy um, and, you know, are considered quite radical. I think the best description for that, I, you know, that kind of resonates with me is that they create art through social experience. So it's quite different to, you know, many of the Western concepts of art uh, and it generated a lot of headlines. So on the plane, I was reading uh, the, New Yorker, the New York Times magazine and there was about 8,000 words devoted to, uh, you know, what happened in Documenta this year. Um, so really intriguing and Aaron actually went to, he was in Castle. So I'm really excited about interrogating that a bit further and, you know, learning a little bit more about Ruin Gruppe and what they stand for and all those things. Um, but I'd very much like to start off because we are here in Bali, uh, talking about Bali with Ibu Sastra. Um, I want to, um, I mean, I guess for a long time we've thought of Balinese art as, you know, the beautiful, intricate wooden carvings and then also those paintings, again, incredibly detailed, beautiful paintings depicting the Hindu epic, you know, the epic Hindu stories. So almost like the painting illustrations of the Wayang, the puppet show. Um, but of course, you know, there's also a lot of exciting contemporary art happening uh, here in Bali and, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of development on the long of themes of ecology and conservation and also protest art as well. Um, and so I wanted, I mean, we've got the perfect person here to talk about uh, particularly, I guess, protest art and how uh, some of the conservation movements here in Bali have, have really used art, you know, as part of their activism. Um, so I was wondering first if you could tell us a bit about and I know that you are a member of the Banoa Bay Conservation Movement. Can you explain a bit about the controversy around the, the Banoa Bay Reclamation Project? Yeah, it's uh, thank you, Bujul, uh, uh, Aaron, and everybody um, who's here and um, uh, loving art and also loving Bali. I'm uh, happy to be here and be talking about uh, the art scene here in Indonesia and the possible future of it. Of course, uh, not uh, not in any attempt to having a uh, a kind of a, a kind of a total idea of it, but I'm I'm um, um, I'm uh, I want to share some of my view about what uh, uh, the art scenes now, especially as Bujul said that um, when we think about Bali, we are imagining the exotic about Bali, we are imagining the romantic about Bali, and um, we have a a, a very a vivid. Uh, idea or a concept of Bali, but uh, through some of the artists that uh, I want to share, that I uh, I adore them very much, but I also share their passion about art and how to speak through art, uh, through uh, paintings and through music, through um, uh, performance arts, which uh, uh, now I think it's a, def a kind of a defining moment here in Bali, especially when Bali is facing, as Bujul said, um, uh, 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 many developments, and those developments are um, are in 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 
uh, opposition to the values uh, of how uh, Balinese live and how uh, they maintain their principles. So, um, of course, as uh, Banoa Bay, uh, just to just to sum uh, summarize, what's the uh, the controversy behind the Banoa Bay? Banoa Bay is um, is a uh, is an area, is a cove in the southern of Bali. If you go uh, through airplanes, you will see the, the bay. It's a very beautiful place, one of a um, mangrove or a mangrove forest uh, 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 area protected uh, apart from the one in Sanur. And uh, for uh, since 2015, there's been an attempt to uh, create artificial islands there uh, around 700 hectares and the resistance uh, um, by the people um, uh, through uh, many forms of art activism is one of the key points uh, in Benoa Bay movement. Um, even until now, I think uh, one of the continuation is the rejection of the um, facility for uh, LNG, for liquid gas uh, facility um, uh, in um, in the coast uh, that could dam damage uh, Sanur and Benoa coast. Um, it's also a, continu a continuation of that realization of uh, how our uh, natural world uh, here in Bali is being threatened. Um, so there are uh, artists that I, uh, I, re I truly admire, such as Alit Ambara, and then also Madi Bayak, and um, of course one of my favorite, uh, Chitra Sasmita, she's here, that I'm uh, happy later on to talk about it uh, uh, in, in, in depth. So, um, yeah, it, that's the current uh, discussion about uh, uh, B uh, Bali's artists, yeah. Yeah, and I'm really interested also in, I guess, feminism and mm. how artists are mm. um, representing feminism in Bali. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, Bujul, because I said earlier that we, when we imagine the Balinese culture and as Balinese, um, we are constantly, uh, I feel constantly negotiating between uh, protecting those valued uh, principles that have been pr who's who's been uh, around for uh, hundreds of years, but also in a way how we try to, uh, uh, to break through and try to identify ourselves as individual and being in the now and talking about freedom, talking about equality. Um, uh, of course, uh, there are artists who I think uh, their works, such as Chitra Sasmitas, uh, she's one of the um, female artists here who's been working, uh, conceptualizing and also manifesting those ideas into work of arts. Uh, please look up for her uh, uh, work of arts. Uh, she's one of the contemporary who's uh, uh, who has the courage to uh, uh, to fight the kind of a uh, gatekeeper uh, idea of um, who's uh, who's and who's should be in the art community and who's been accepted into uh, that situation? So um, uh, some of her arts, uh, uh, such as Mea Kulpa, Mea Fulfa, and then Timur Mera project, um, the Womb uh, project, and then she also. Uh, helped uh, a pivotal plays a pivotal role in organizing communities, uh, talking about uh, how to empower uh, women through uh, art, uh, through a Futu Wonder project. And I think uh, she's w one of the um, um, artists, contemporary uh, Balinese artists, uh, who's been preserving the idea, the rebellion made by a previous artist uh, named Igusti Ketut, uh, Igusti Ketut Murniasi, um, talking about uh, inequality, sexual violence, and how to challenge uh, those structures, those power structures. So please, everybody, get familiar to Chitra Sasmita. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just happy to talk about you. I can do this all day. <laughs> you should be here. <laughs> you should be here. <laughs> can you talk a bit about how she does that? About yeah. her art? Yes, yes, of course. And um, of course, it's uh, it's the 
the burgeoning uh, contemporary Balinese artists, especially talking about um, how women's bodies being projected by uh, themselves. Um, and when you see Timur Mera project, uh, it was one of the um, uh, work of art uh, curated by the Jakarta Arts Council, and um, which she uses the kamasan technique and aesthetic and flipped it to express her narrative. And if you should know about the kamasan uh, tradition, uh, the traditional like that one there, you can see, um, it's uh, specifically uh, sometimes taken that all artists are male artists. But what she's done, she used the technique to retell the story of women. And in her depictions, um, a, a certain, a, a, a growth, I would say, a, a, a empowering grotesque aesthetic to cause discomfort. And inequality and subjugation is something uh, very, uh, very disturbing that it should be, uh, it should be, uh, it should be, uh, taken seriously. So uh, you you would see uh, female bodies with uh, blood, with snakes, with uh, fire coming from through their bodies and those anger, those pain, um, but also a, a sense of hope, a sense of hope in her work. So yeah, for being uh, sisters from this island, <laughs> we are, as I said earlier, we are constantly uh, in that in-between realm of loving our culture, our our philosophy, but also trying to push through to that uh, um, that that fr that fr <laughs> free space. Yeah. And have these works been controversial here in Bali? Her What's work. It? Yeah. Of course, there are resistance, uh, but I think that's 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 the that's the role of as a, a, a grotesque aesthetic, as Arthur Danto would say, um, the 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 purpose of the art is to create conversation, is to become, um, is to cause a disorientation on what already a stability that we call an art scene here in Bali. So yeah. That it means that we're doing, she's doing something, yeah, very meaningful. Yeah. <laughs> and you also had an exhibition of her work, didn't you, at, at Museum Yeah, Mitchell. in Museum Machan, betul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I first met Aaron when I was the foreign correspondent for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, and it was when Museum Machan um, opened in, in Jakarta. Um, and it was something quite new, I think, for, for Indonesia. Can you explain a bit just about the, I guess, the philosophy of Museum Machen? So firstly, um, we, were, we opened in November 2017, so we're still quite young, still very young. I mean, we had at least two years of pandemic in, in that mix. The acronym Machen stands for Modern and Contemporary Art in the Sahara. Um, so we're... Our perspective is very much of this place. I mean, we, we understand that we operate in a global context, but we look at that global context from the position of Nusantara. I think that that's probably one of the founding principles. The other really important founding principle is education. So we're a private museum, and um, the founder of the, of the museum and their foundation is very much geared towards um, um, education, arts education in particular. And the reason being is that you know this is a, a, a collection that's been amassed over 30 years um, from a from a wealthy family, who and he, um, pa Harianto is is somebody who he says that he learnt a lot as a businessman looking at art, and so he wanted to be able to share that with um, with the broader Indonesian public. And he's really specific about why. Firstly, it's because in the multi uh, religious, multi-ethnic context, being able to see other perspectives is important. You know, so it, it engenders empathy, and that's what he has learnt through, through art, and he thinks that this is something that needs to be passed on to children. Secondly, he believes that art actually helps to build critical dialogue, so, and, he, and I think just in terms of uh, the future and I suppose the role of education generally, um, if uh, art is a really good place to start when you want to talk about 
uh, critical thinking. Yeah. So, I mean, you'd basically just established the museum and then we had a global pandemic. Mm. How did you keep art alive during the pandemic? Well, I think that the, the thing is that art doesn't actually die. It changes, um, you know, stuff gets thrown at, at artists, but there's always questions to be asked and answered. And I think that that's uh, Im the, the important role that artists play, play in our society. But having said that, it was an incredibly difficult um, period and I think it's difficult for everyone. Um, we were very conscious of our privilege. I mean, I've worked for a private, private museum and we were very aware that actually artists were suffering. So one of the things that we did do is I created a, a program where we, where we mobilised the infrastructure of the museum to create support for artists, not just in Jakarta, but across, um, across the, the, the country, where artists were supporting artists. Um, yeah, anyway, there were, there were lots of things. I mean, it, it, we've, we've learned a lot, actually, from, from the pandemic period. And I think um, the silver lining is that how we research now is probably much more attuned to what's going on locally. And that's probably a, a, a very positive thing. And we, perhaps we see this uh, with other curators around the world, that, that, that lack of, lack of um, physical connection meant that you had to really think about your immediate communities. Okay. Yep. Um, you've obviously just had a really successful exhibition um, with Agus Suwagi. Yep. Um, and I think I saw on social media that you said that it's been, you know, one of the most... Uh, in terms of generating comments from your colleagues, from other artists, from your peers, but also from children, some of whom have never, uh, you know, have never been to probably a gallery before. Yep. What was it, do you think, that really resonated? And, I mean, I guess for people that aren't familiar with Agusuagi's body of work, if you could talk a bit about sure, sure. this exhibition. I've got a few slides. I'm gonna, I've, I've tried to keep the visuals to a, to a minimum, but just to kind of give some prompts. Um, I think that the title of this panel is The Future of Indonesian Art. I actually want to start maybe where Indonesian art, contemporary arts, one of, the, one of the starting points, which is really uh, reformasi and also globalisation. And Agus Suwagi is a beneficiary of both of those, um, uh, is very much caught up in, 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 in that moment. Um, based in Jakarta right before reformasi and then moved to uh, Jogja afterwards. Um, he was, his work revolves around uh, very much the thinking through the political and social, si that social situation, but also he's a beneficiary of globalization. And what I mean by that is uh, almost immediately he was able to travel. You know, he went to Japan, he was included in the Havana Biennale, he was included in the uh, Asia Pacific Triennial in, in Brisbane. So it was a moment when the world, the Western world in particular, became interested in the non-West and also when solidarities between um, other Asian contexts were coming, coming together. So that's a, a very, very important moment. And also I think that it's important in, in terms of the history of, of Indonesia itself. Um, um, so he's that generation where I think a lot of contemporary artists, and I think, I mean, we've, we've spoken about Chitra, there are other women artists from that period as well, so people like Aramayani who, who, and, and Mela Yasma, like that, this group of, of artists who similarly benefited from uh, global connectivity, but also were reflecting um, politically. We had a great response, I think, because it was a beautiful show. Um, <laughs> And it was a mammoth effort to do in it during during the pandemic. There was there were about thirty lenders to the exhibition. Um, it covered thirty uh, about thirty years, thirty thirty plus years of of art making, and just I think that there was just a kind of relief on one hand, but also joy to be able to see uh, things in spaces again, and then to be able to see people in spaces. Um, but one of the things that we always do with our exhibitions, especially Indonesian, when we're working with Indonesian artists, is to think about those connectivities between uh, political history, the artists' biographies, and then also what's going on globally. So this is a, a wall, it's it, a wall in an archive, and it's one of the most important parts of the exhibition where we are tracking those three things. Um, so the political history of Indonesia, Suwagi's, um uh, his background, and then also what's going on on, on globally. The, we in the f in during the f um, we we have a lot of kids come through, but we brought in a, a group of 
middle school children for our press preview. And then at the end of, the, end of their tour, I asked the teacher, so what is it that the kids are interested in? And they said, what she said is that actually they're really interested in the 1990s. Uh, they're really interested in this timeline because they're curious about the, the democracy and they don't really know, I mean, maybe it's a bit, also a bit of a nostalgia as well, but they don't really know very much about this time period. So th that, was, that was actually quite, um, it was really quite warming for us, but it also tells us that when you hear people say that kids don't read and that they're not interested, that it's actually not always true. That really, I, I find the curiosity of Indonesian children is, is it's exciting. Um, they're coming, yeah. I mean, you're, you're saying that we're, we're dealing with new, new museum audiences, people who have never stepped into this spaceship. I mean, we're literally like a spaceship that's landed. And so that they're coming with their eyes wide open and with a curiosity. I mean, you don't have to understand everything, but they get to experience and, and see firsthand. And how did you get them to the museum? Were there outreach programs in schools or...? We've been working with schools and children for five years. It was actually the first thing that we did before we opened, is I was sending my education team to go out to schools. Um, we wanted to work in partnership with the education system. And if, if teachers have never been into a museum themselves, how, do we, how are we going to expect them to bring their, their students? So we had to work really, really hard. Um, it was literally door knocking. Um, one of the first hires in the museum was an, was um, an ex-teacher, and his job was really to help generate that that interest and to de develop those networks. And it's been built since 2016 right through to now. Uh, we've got a very strong group of um, teachers. In fact, during the pandemic, it was the teachers who were, who were giving us advice about how to better deliver materials. Uh, and they were the ones who, like we, do lots of, we did a lot of stuff online, and they were the ones who were saying, the kids don't have, have smartphones, they don't have computers but I'm going to set up a situation like this and borrow, borrow a projector and bring um, multiple class, classrooms of children in. And it was, it was their, really, it was their initiative. And, and that's been built through, um, you know, through f over five years of, of working together. So the art at Museum Machin can be politically sensitive, and we were talking before about Arimayana, who uh, at one point she fled to Perth in the 1990s when her art was raising questions about religious intolerance in Indonesia, and she was receiving death threats from Islamic hardliners after an exhibition, obviously not at Museum Machin, it predated that, but um, an exhibition that she did in Jakarta. How, I mean, there are, you know, sensitivities in Indonesia and I'm thinking about communism, about West Papua, about Papua, about um, LGBTQI. How do you navigate those at the museum? How do you, uh, I guess, avoid censorship or, um, yeah, how, how, how do you handle this? Um, I think hopefully with diplomacy. <laughs> um, it's, it's not an easy thing and I, I think that it... If, if you ever you hear a museum director or a curator stand up and say that they are not involved in censorship, they're not telling the full truth. In any country? In anywhere. Um, it, it also in Australia, particularly mm. in Australia, but we mm. just don't like to talk about it. We make decisions all the time. I mean, that's one of the things about curatorship is that we're, 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 we're discerning A against B or putting this work against another work. There are all of these decisions that have been, are, are happening. Um, we need to be aware, and this is part of the hospitality thing. I mean, I think that there's lots of conversations right now around care, and, yeah. and uh, but I think the, the flip side of care is hospitality. So we need to be, we need to be aware of our sensi the sensitivities of our audiences. B because why would you want to just piss somebody off? I mean, it, it seems counterproductive to me. You, it's more important to draw people into a conversation and to understand their point of view. Um, lots of those sensitivities that people have are not just within the broader community, but parts of it trickle down into the artist community as well. So it's not, a, it's not black and white. And this actually goes back to this period of, of, of uh, the 90s. This is the, the contest that happens in public space um, through reformasi, right? This is, this is, everything is possible at this point. And so we need to find modes or methods of engagement where we can work through this stuff. It's, a, it's unfinished business. It's not, um, 
Uh, and I think working in Indonesia, it's constantly surprising as well which way and where these um, sensitivities lie. But having said that, we're, we're really careful because, because um, I don't want to test lots of these laws. Um, and actually, Suwagi is a, another interesting point. In, the, in 2004, he was involved in one of the most important artist controversies in Indonesia, which really changed regulations around pornography and um, the representation of the body. Um, and these thing, and he even says that these, this is unfinished business, it's ongoing. I mean, we're, we're constantly part of it. Yeah, I didn't answer your question, but... You know. well, <laughs> I mean, no, one of the things that struck me when I went, say, to the Augusta Wagi exhibition was that, I mean, obviously, like, basically, kind of, it's an Instagram dream at the museum. Like, people love taking Instagrams, but there was a couple of... It's OK, I think, for the, for the moment. Um, there were a couple of ex exhibits, for example, where there were guards and they said, please don't take photographs. And I assume that that was so things didn't get um, spread on social media. Is that... Is that why you well, that, did that? Well, that, that, that is part of it. And Margie, my communications manager, is here. I mean, we go through lots of conversations about what, how to approach this. Um, we, we, I think, I mean, the netizens, I mean, I think the biggest fear that we have is netizens. Um, how, how would you control a situation that you cannot control? Uh, you can't control that narrative. People, w once it gets, once it turns viral like that, we're no longer talking about the issue. <laughs> we're no longer talking about um, uh, the artist or the or the the actual censorship itself. The, the the issue that's being censored, it's just completely uncontrollable. So yeah, we do put in place those things, um, and some of those sensitivities are around young children seeing, seeing the body. And it's, I mean, it's really, it's not for me to. I mean, I have an opinion about that, but I think that that needs to be that there are other, other, their guardians who also need to be involved in that conversation. So actually we prefer not, certain things not to be shown. So you're going to give an example, I yep. think, of a Papuan piece of art? So this kind of answers two of your questions. Like one of the things that we were doing during the pandemic, um, we couldn't travel. And th those two years, I really wanted to go and do as much research in Indonesia as possible. So Indonesia, we're constantly told it's diverse. But where is it? Where is that diversity? How, where do we see it? It's it's very it's very hard to discern. Um, so this project, we um, I raised a bit of money. I went to some of my patrons and um, partners and said, "Give me five thousand dollars, and we're going to redistribute this to other organisations." So we had organisations in Bandung, in in Papua, in um, Makassar, in Jatiwangi, and there was another place. Um, <laughs> um, and where we, where we, get, we gave uh, um, a partner organization, often a Biennale in Georgia. Um, we gave a partner organization some money to, to give to an artist and also to support one local curator. And so what happened, we didn't know if we were going to be able to have an exhibition. So it was all about discussion, the research and the online discussion, and hoping that they might use that money to generate ideas and projects in their, in their communities. Um, one of the projects that we were working on with, jo with the Jogja Biennale was with the Ude Idu Collective in Papua, who I think are one of the most interesting um, collectives working in Indonesia right now. Very much is, I mean, they're, they're, most of their members are from Jogja, but they're really, it's really about uh, the Papuan experience. We had lots of conversations about this, this particular work. Um, there are a lot. There's many. There's many. There's l a lot of layering within it, and um, there's a lot of historical information in it. What we did is we actually used the Uda Ido um, uh, structure, which is really around discussion, and we said we may have a problem. Let's have a conversation about where these problems may lie. How do we go about this in a way which doesn't shut everyone down and also importantly doesn't put your members and your community at risk? So that's a part of the negotiation. Some people might call that censorship, but I'm always really upfront with an artist when we have to have that conversation. Um, and they are usually the first ones to know when we are having difficulties. Kay. But it was beautiful. This is the most beautiful work and I'm really happy that it was collected um, by actually by an Australian collector, and it will have a life outside of of uh, Indonesia. So it will be sh it will be seen.
it'll be seen in its entirety. Um, and that's also one of the, the roles about these networks is that, is that we can share and we can make sure that information has future lives. So this was not actually exhibited? It was exhibited. Oh, it was, yep. okay. This is the only image that you'll find of it. Right. Yep. Oh, so it's more about not actually having, it was at the museum, so you could see it yep. there, but it's about it not really living as part of the digital collection, is that? Um, uh, th it is, there are images of it online, but it's highly regulated. Okay. So uh, all of the information that you need is actually in this, in this image, um, but we, uh, it, and, and to be honest, it's a really benign thing. That's this central totem structure is about sharing. It was, there was supposed to be a performance where the, the audience were coming in to, to work with the dance and to work with the, to work with the artists to re rearrange parts of the display. So it's really about, about sharing. It's about um, coming together. So there's actually there's nothing really that controversial in it, but we're just hyper aware maybe. Yeah. So on to Documenta. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that, uh, you know, this was the first time that it was directed or curated. I don't think Ruin Grupa liked the word curated, but directed by a group rather than an individual. Um, and I'm just, how well known is Ruin Grupa in Indonesia? Um, before uh, answering that, can I just uh, comment on of what... Of course. Th about the pandemic, about of course, art during yeah. the pandemic. I was thinking about um, how... Uh, art, uh, art spaces are created and how art spaces um, uh, build up um, a, a new sensibility. And I agree that in Indonesia right now, there's a great interest in contemporary art. And also it goes uh, hand in hand, it goes along with uh, the culture of sharing through uh, social medias. Um, uh, objects and also uh, uh, visual objects or uh, even um, uh, uh, installation and it's been um, uh, it's been um, happening uh, it's been happening for uh, it's been happening for uh, quite some time but during the pandemics I think also uh, the Apart from Museum Machan, we also have um, other spaces uh, such as District Seni. Now, if you go to Sarina in Jakarta, and most of it is being supported by the government, which is I think it's good that um, uh, they are fun uh, coming into uh, and focusing into how we understand those uh, uh, spaces and. Uh, creating interest to art, but also uh, from a critical point of view, um, I was just w thinking about that apart from having that uh, public space, uh, about having art in those spaces that we understand as something of uh, a formalistic space that we accept as uh, art space. Of course, um, uh, there are also other spaces of uh, uh, even uh, 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 hetero, uh, uh, heterogeneous uh, spaces happening, um, especially during the pandemic when um, the pandemic causing a lot of problems, especially with uh, starvation in some parts of uh, Indonesia, uh, not far from Jakarta, like Tangerang, and then um, uh, like in Bekasi, uh, uh, people are uh, protesting about uh, how to uh, how to stay alive and uh, how to how to uh, how to how to feed themselves. And it created, because the, there's also uh, a, a sense of a, sh a shrinking, <laughs> carefully, Aaron just said, like very carefully just now, that is, um, to me, I think there's um, a palpable a shrinking uh, uh, a space for democracy here in Indonesia. And um, what's interesting about the movement happening uh, during that pandemic also is um, how politics is being transferred uh, in talking about the elite politics in Indonesia. It's being transferred by politics uh, uh, through the people and through um, uh, street artists 
also happening. So one of the occurrence, for instance, there's a very uh, famous uh, incident um, which uh, there are plenty of um, uh, walls uh, being uh, full with gravity and murals. And one of it uh, says just a very simple writing, Tuhan aku lapar with uh, three exclamation marks. Uh, God, I'm hungry with three exclamation marks. Immediately, it is being erased uh, by the authority. So what I'm trying to say, there's also in the future of Indonesia that, that type of art space where it talks about um, uh, the voice of um, the, the, the marginalized who hasn't been um, being recognized. Um, of course, um, uh, there's um, if what's interesting also, uh, here in Bali, there's a, a kind of a communal for uh, street artists that's uh, the, a kind of a meeting called uh, Bali Yang Binal. Uh, naughty Bali, but Binal, is it naughty? It's a, a more like an erotic kind of a, uh, a naughty, Bali yang Binal, which is also a kind of a satire to uh, a, a very, uh, I think it's very, uh, a kind of a pun for Bali Biennale, um, which I think um, um, the, the artists uh, such as Slinat and then um, people in Visual Jalanan, if you go to their Instagrams, their socials, um, uh, street uh, uh, street uh, visuals, uh, they keep on trying to uh, 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 push kind of a, a work of art, uh, an ephemeral work of art. In a way, it's very ephemeral that it's on a wall, it can be easily demolished, it's, it's very vulnerable as an object, but the idea of the protest and the idea of the uh, 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 rebellion is uh, what makes it very important. And, um, and as what you said earlier, of course, about uh, documentary and how it's, um, um, how it's being curated by uh, several individuals. And I think that's also very interesting in talking about documentation and how um, film documentary, um, uh, there are two artists now in Indonesia named Tita Salina and Irwan Ahmed. Uh, uh, those two, the duo, uh, they, they also work collectively with the people from, uh, 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 from uh, Jakarta, the coastal Jakarta, um, in, trying to, um, in trying to make sense the kind of a mall development and um, the, the, the problem of um, the problem of the environmental effect of uh, building artificial islands, especially for fishermen uh, uh, on the coast of Jakarta. And I think um, um, those uh, acts and not only um, limiting uh, artists and work of art into individual uh, creation, but also um, in, intertwining with other people and public and for Tita Salina and Irwan Ahmed for instance uh, they are trying to they are also working with um, nature with the ocean, with the polluted ocean um, with how is ocean being um, uh, being so toxic with plastics and um, uh, and and other materials. So I, I was thinking about how collectively um, we are thinking about uh, work of art and artists. Would you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So yeah. So Ruan Gruppe is isn't it? It's like a, a, a sort of radical collective. Can you explain a mm. bit about their philosophy and? I think it's actually that that is the philosophy. The f philosophy yeah. is if you look at the very early writings that they were doing and their very early, very early projects, it is about finding a space at that time for youth. That's the word that right. Ade uses a lot, youth, mm -hmm. in the context of this contest between the elite and the non-elite. So, uh, and it's very, very particular to Jakarta. I mean, that's where that they were from, or that's mm. where they are from. Mm -mm. Um, you know, it's a city that had been pretty much given over to developers. So, yeah. what, of the, what about the little people? That's the that's the that's I think is the point. It's it's very much an idea of globalization from the ground up. 
you know, the, the, the space, of, space for small narratives and the possibility to engage with art, but not in the context of an elite activity. So it's not about galleries. Okay. It's, um, it's about coming together and sharing stuff. So, you know, we were talking before some of the earliest projects that were working with um, parking attendants. Parking yeah. attendants were one of the, the um, participants in, 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 pro in, in some of the projects. They were transforming exhibition spaces into parties. So the party as a, as, as a, as a medium to um, be social um, and not have to create art objects but still be participating in the creation of art. Um, yeah, so it is, it is radical, and, but I think that lots of these collectors and, and you know, some of the things that you, you, you've, you've just uh, said now about uh, uh, Tita and, um, and, and Masiwana, uh, is, is you can see that there's a connection between how yeah. I think Indonesians of that particular generation think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because yeah. 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 this Jogja, the Jogja exhibition, I mean, it was yeah. fascinating to kind of read about in terms of that people who attended the party didn't necessarily realise that they were a part of the art. Yeah. And then the debris yeah. of the party afterwards just stayed for the duration of the exhibition. And, you know, the yeah. food started to rot, weevils came in. Weevils and that was and maggots. Maggots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that was the exhibition. So, um, so I guess what happens when you have a very famous global contemporary exhibition and then you have, uh, you know, a radical Indonesian collective and you have this clash of cultures and worlds and, I mean, it did generate a huge amount of headlines. Can you explain a bit about sort of some of the, I guess, cultural clashes and some of the controversies? Um, yeah, but um, let's not talk about them because we'll be here all all day. All so right, there very is, briefly. There, there's, there, there has been a, um, accusations and also evidence of anti-Semitism, and that's been one of the big things. Mm. So that the German infrastructure, the kind of governance and bureaucracy, is very interested in in uh, that weight of history in terms mm. of um, uh, the Jewish the Jewish experience. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't. F the other thing about the exhibition is it doesn't fit into the normal idea about what an exhibition is. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I think yeah. that, you know, what we were, I think what we're talking about is that yeah. it's, they're not about representation. Yeah. So it's not about representing communities or representing a process. It is actually about the process. Mm -mm. And that requires a, a bit of a shift in mindset for, for you know, good middle-class bourgeois audiences to think differently about their hallowed museum halls, you yeah. know, that people can, anyone can, anyone can be there. You could be the, um, you could be a street kid and, and be able to be in that space. Um, and so I'm going to just show, I'm uh, showing a few images. This is one of the first things that you see. I mean, there are very few art objects. So one of the first things that you see, and I always get the pronunciation wrong, the Fredericianium in Kassel. It's a, it's a neoclassical building. First thing that you see is probably what we all have at our front doors. It's a welcome mat. Um, and this is not an art object. I think it just gives you an indication that actually you're welcome. This is one of my favorite images that I took. I don't have very, me very many images of art. I've got images of people just hanging out, enjoying themselves. And I've written the, the little inscription here I've written is an exhibition as multitasking. So the inset, you can see the, see the actual exhibition there. there are artwork banners, uh, it's, you can see parts of that neoclassical building. But then they've created these structures where actually you can hang out and read. All of the, all of the um, materials are there for you to read and people were doing it. I mean, I think it was really, really beautiful. Um, and then quickly, the first thing that you see is, it's called Rural Kids. And so if any of you know about Rural Grouper, that they also have a kids program. So this is effectively a creche um, so when you walk into the building, on the right-hand side, you've got that welcome mat. And then on the left-hand wing, you have effectively what is a creche. So activities for children. So what does that tell you? That there's the, their preferences or their priorities are different from normal, normal classical exhibition making. Education often comes afterwards. But what would happen if education actually came first? What would happen if you said to people, actually, you're welcome? 
um, anything, anything can happen in, 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 in this space. So I thought that was a really re very beautiful um, um, touch. It looks really free form, but as I was saying to a friend of mine yesterday, the, the level of detail in terms of the design and they're thinking through public space, which is actually what the basis of Ruin Grouper is, I think, is really uh, about arguments mm -hmm. of uh, public space, is, is very, very strong. The other, th other video is in the Documenta Hollow. It, what they include, there is traditional artwork there. You can see the mural on the, on the back. There's, on the other side, there's a work from Bangladesh. But there's actually a skate ramp. And it's not just a representation of a skate ramp to represent the kids who, who might be allowed to come in. It actually functions as a meeting point for people. And it, it, it just, it, it doesn't, it's not an inversion of where the, those publics lie. It's just action. So it's, it, that's, that's the thing that I, I think that, that comes out of it. Um, activities happening. The other thing that was in this hall was a printing press. So, you know, it was just, it was just a beautiful, uh, moment. There were, you know, when when I was when you're outside of that exhibition space, lots of conversation about the anti-Semitism and they should have done this, they should have done that. That was right, that was wrong. But when you go through the spaces, all you see are people with smiles on their faces. Uh, and I think that um, what I said to the to some of the curators is that it was wonderful in the true sense of that word. word. It was just filled with opportunities to w wander and to wonder. So. And it seems a classic example of where a media furore, if you like, can overshadow an event, you know, and, and sort of when there was clearly a lot of joy and a lot of merit to the exhibition. I think, that, I think exhibitions like that also fit within a bigger um, system, ecosystem. <laughs> um, and it, I think that, that that is really talking about something else. It's really talking about the German state. It's not, is it re it's not so, it is of course connected to the exhibition, but there are just layers of, of um, layers going on. And that's just a, it's not a meta -na narrative because it was kind of almost central, but it was, it's not necessarily talking about, but it's super important because it, I think with this documenter, you begin, you begin to better see the puppet masters and how that this works. Hmm. I mean, it's a cla I, the way that I also describe it is a clash of epistemes. Mm -mm. You know, mm -mm. what happens when you let brown people come in mm -mm. into, um, in, into the, the one of the most powerful uh, European slash Western um, uh, projects? It's, it's a clash of epistemes. They don't actually really know how to talk to each other. I'm aware we've talked for a long time. Are there any <laughs> questions from the audience? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so on the left, yep. You, sorry, no, 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 you're right. The one, the man turning <laughs> around, yep. <laughs> uh, I'm Sidi from Bali. So talking about the future, future of Indonesian art, uh, I have like one question about like the future of the distributions and infrastructures and then supportive ecosystem and how we include the forgotten issues actually. Because we've been seeing like the art has been centralized mostly in Java, Bali, Bandung, Jogja, well. At the same time, we have like Makassar Biennale to focus on the East Indonesian and also to develop, uh, maybe also to preserve like their own practices. But uh, we, we can see like we have some other practices that might not be included in what we call as aesthetical contemporary art or as a white cube gallery based art. Uh, sometimes it gives the sense that the art and the issues brought in the artworks will only be seen and discussed if it's shown in the central area like Bali, Java and uh, you know Jakarta, Bandung. At the same time, we've seen the developing of collective as well and how art opened its space to the other disciplines they intersect with it. Like Good School has, uh, they done like a mapping of collective from all over Indonesia uh, through like Fixer Project, I think. And yeah, I mean, my questions will be like, as a curators, writers, and also like museum management, how you see like this into, uh, Indonesian contemporary art, uh, how, how to decentralize like the art to like the other areas and or region of Indonesia. Thank you. What you want to okay, thank, thank you, Sidi. Um, he's also a very uh, talented uh, photographer. Um, 
I think also, as you said earlier, how how we this you use the word uh, distribute um, uh, and to become a more creating a, a, an egalitarian uh, co um, co art communities um, uh, strewn across Indonesia, and some I think some of the attempt to. Uh, show the diversity in Indonesia in a way as I said earlier uh, of course we are uh, g happy and grateful that there's uh, focus and care for how to as Aaron said um, to maintain the ecosystem um, uh, um, uh, of arts in uh, the eastern part of Indonesia for instance um, and it's coming through, uh, uh, especially, as you said, uh, through festivals. And um, uh, now, I think, uh, never before in, uh, in Indonesian uh, history, now I think most of it is being funded by uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, funding from the government. And in a, in a way, it's, uh, uh, it's a, a, a good affirmative uh, political act by the government, but also what I'm trying, and I'm 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 with you by saying how do we avoid when we think about uh, diverse artistic uh, uh, experiences and individuals? How do we um, how do we reject uh, tokenism uh, by just uh, by just um, uh, by just uh, putting uh, the work of the, the work of art or the individual merely there, as I said earlier, um, um, the, for instance, such as the uh, street artists in uh, in Bali and Binal, they are thinking how not only w the work of art and the artists, they are trying also to um, uh, create uh, not only as uh, when we see in the facade of, um, of in Indonesia as a tourist destination, for instance, where we are thrown uh, by images and practice of uh, art such as dance that is sometimes it's purely uh, very uh, banal, it, just in the facade. But when we are talking about the experiences by uh, the, the the people living in eastern part of Indonesia, um, uh, there's a disparity there. So um, yeah, I, I I would think how to how do we promote culture, and to also not only promote culture it as an object, but it's as a life world of this community. Uh, I think that's also the the task and how to uh, formulate that right now. Yeah. We might just, sorry, move to that. Yes. Yep. You, yep. Hi, I'm Jonathan. I'm Surabaya. I'm, I'm an artist. So uh, my question is, how can we sell? How can we sell our art if it's uh, if it's give other perspective from others? Because uh, my mentor told me that uh, when you are want to be a commercial artist, you have to like this. Follow your emotion and feelings. I'm a very logical person, so it's very hard for me to follow my emotion and feeling. And then uh, it's hard also to uh, it's hard to sell political art. If you are not political sensitive, collector will not buy your art. If you are not uh, so like this, uh, usually uh, I think like collectors in Jakarta they prefer arts like you know digging about the emotion like. You are being you are you are being like a uh, heartbroken, or you are being backstab, or you are being uh, you know all those negative feeling, and you you ha you just have to put that on canvas, and that's what col collector wants. But if you are being like political sensitive, and then you are talking something about like the war in Ukraine, maybe or the West Papua things, uh, he said my mentor said that it's not something that collector wants to buy. So how can we? If, if, if we want to uh, express ourselves through these things from others' perspective, how can we sell our art? Because artists need to sell their art to, to, to live, right? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. Do you have he that? attends every year. <laughs> <laughs> Just everybody that is like, 
just just one one. I think that's a kind of a very complicated um, question to answer in a short period of time. But just to, as one anecdote, Tarang Putty, who are the kind of the core um, artists who created all of this controversy, um, one thing about their practice is that the banners and the things that they actually use in the political uh, protests, they do not call artwork. So that there's already already a distinction. I mean that they've they've created a they have created a, their own set of standards in terms of uh, and set of meanings about why and how and when they do things. So uh, yours is a very complicated answer to, to to have. I think. Yeah, I don't have an answer for you. Sorry, the woman in the blue skirt. Sorry, yeah. we're running out of time. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. To <laughs> one more. One more. Oh, last no. one. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe think, one like, more. Um, there will only be like one last question because of the time limitations. Maybe. Yeah. Oh man, it's about Documenta because I was there at the press preview and I, I'm pissed off that all of this attention got onto that anti-Semitism thing and no attention got put on what Ruang Rupa was trying to do. And actually I kind of want to ask you what you think because of all this unfortunate focus on this stupid issue that these Germans came up with. Um, what really can we do to support what Ruang Rupa is trying to do? This, like they're trying to make a revolution and that's been forgotten. So what are you seeing right now that maybe can give me some heart <laughs> that, that maybe that Documenta made a difference this year? Yeah, and what Ruang Rupa has created uh, radically, radically is uh, the, how when we understand layers of spaces and how spaces are uh, created based on diverse experiences and how those spaces are not only about the 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 the, the, the colored or even the the spectacle of the uh, object, but as Aaron said, it talks about issues and real problems uh, being uh, lived by people uh, across uh, the world. It talks about humanity and also talks about how, how we should overcome and how sh how can we overcome this trap of violence and um, um, and domination? And I think that's the power of art. It creates, in a, in a way, it's I wouldn't say it symbolizes, but also it's our imaginary attempt to create alternative spaces that talk about equality, humanity. Collect, col the collective solidarity, and that's 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 what it is about. It gives gives us hope that artists are working about it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but I'm sure you can come and talk to. Yeah, Aaron there's a, there's a political banner at the back that says <laughs> "Time Out." <laughs> <laughs>